we were discussing the four quantifier laws. Out of that, we have really completed two of them, the simple ones. One was uh, universal specification, another was existential generalization. Then we have to discuss the other two. So, one of them, the universal generalization, we have discussed, right? But proof was informal, we have not proved it completely. Next, our job was to formulate existential specification itself. Okay. So, formulation for universal generalization was okay. So, let us rewrite it again. So, we start with a set of formulas. and x a formula then from x we want to go for for every x x right that was the point so our formulation was if x is a variable that does not occur free in any formula of sigma, then, then we had from sigma until x, we can go for sigma entails for each x x. Okay. That was our universal generalization. So, all that we need is if x is not free in sigma in the premises, if x is not free in the premises then you can go for generalizing over that particular variable x that is the crucial point. Then we wanted to formulate existential specification. Here again our motivation was in arguments when you uh, have one premise for example, there is x p x you use p c where c is one ambiguous name we do not know exactly to which element in your domain it refers, but it can refer to one of the elements that much we know. So, it is an ambiguous name right then we just write p c now from p c and along with other premises we conclude that something say q c right. Then from q c we generalize or even if there is no c at all occurring in the conclusion then whatever you have concluded that follows from the original that was our point. Okay. So, somehow this ambiguous name is eliminated in the proof. Okay. So, that means suppose you have sigma as the set of premises then you have sigma along with there is x p x. So, from there you conclude some y fine. Then you say that from sigma and there is x p x also follows y is it clear. So, the whole proof methodology goes like this you have there is x p x, but you cannot say that there is x p x entails p c. So, you start with sigma along with p c right in for y from this you conclude that sigma along with there is x p x also gives you y is it clear. <coughs> so, that means it would look something the conclusion of existential specification would look something like this sigma union some formula entails y then sigma union there is x x and tells y is it ok. So, along with the premises you have really starting from this you are starting from this in your proof, but you know for this there is x x will give the element we do not know exactly. So, we just take one ambiguous name c and instantiate this. Now, from this along with the premises there follows y therefore, we conclude from this follows y it is a bit complex in this formulation, 
but while using this is what we do right. So, let us formulate it here what are the constants we need that this constant c should not occur in sigma right why is it so suppose you have already told Socrates is something now you say there exists a man with this property can you tell Socrates is also that having that property we do not know unless anything specific is told about Socrates right. So, this c should not have occurred in sigma and then our proof procedure says that the c has been eliminated in the proof somewhere. So, that we get y that means c also does not occur in y fine well there is also one more constant suppose in x itself originally there is c okay. for example, p x c there is x p x c we cannot say there is x p x c will give you p c c that c can be different now right. So, that means this constant is completely new it neither occurs in any formula of sigma nor in x nor in y is it clear. So, now we can formulate by writing this conditions let sigma be a set of formulas x y formulas let c be a constant that does not occur in any of sigma or even x or y ok. Now, if sigma union x x by c and tells y then sigma union there is x x and tells y. <coughs> See this constant anyway is being eliminated. So, instead of a constant you can also take a variable is that right it is just a symbol that symbol should not have occurred that is the main point right. So, we may have also or a variable once it is a variable and you say the variable does not occur it means the variable does not occur free due to renaming right. If that variable occurs bound you can also rename it equivalently. So, it will amount to a variable that does not occur free both will be acceptable right. So, let us now prove them. So, this proof of universal generalization we have already discussed ok. Let us give a formal proof now. So, how do we proceed? So, let us do it by contradiction it may be quicker. Hmm. So, let us we want to prove sigma entails for each x x. So, we will start with one state which is a state model of sigma and try to show that that becomes a state model of for each x x right. So, by contradiction if you want we take one state model of this which is not a state model of this right. So, suppose i l is a state uh, which satisfies sigma, but I l falsifies for each x x <coughs> fine. So, once I l falsifies it means there exists one element in the domain of the interpretation under which I l is a state such that such that I l x fixed to d does not satisfy x right is that ok. So, you want falsifies. So, that means then for some element d. So, I am not writing it completely this i l assumption is i equal to d phi l is one valuation under that. So, for some element d in d i l x fixed to d falsifies x. 
right because when you come to il satisfies for each x x that will mean for each element d in d il x fixed to d satisfies x so that is not that doesn't hold so there is at least one element for some element il x fixed to d does not satisfy x just from our formal semantics whatever way we have introduced the semantics fine okay see we have to use this sigma intel x somewhere so once you say il satisfies sigma is the same thing are telling il x fixed to d satisfies sigma why is it so because x does not occur right does not occur free in any formula of sigma x itself does not occur so that is your relevance lemma right if x does not occur then whatever value we fix to it it doesn't matter whether it satisfies or not will be fixed by the original valuation right so we see now that il x fix to d satisfies sigma due to relevance lemma right otherwise you can see what is its effect l and l x fix to d work the same way on sigma that's what you want to see right x does not occur and l l x fix to d agree on every variable except x x does not occur right so this satisfies or il satisfies are the same that's exactly relevance lemma okay so now you see il x to d is a model of sigma state model of sigma but it falsifies x this contradicts the assumption right this contradicts sigma intel x that's it huh? now short proof comes because of proof by contradiction now proof for existential specification is also similar and here all that we have done is x actually occurs in capital x right otherwise x to d will be vacuous if x does not occur then x or for each x x are equivalent by empty quantification so there is nothing to prove okay so we leave that uninteresting case similarly here if your x does not occur in x right so that also becomes vacuous there is nothing to do this and this are the same both of them are x only equivalent to x okay so how do we proceed here again we want to show sigma union there is x x and tells y right so we start with one state which is a state model of sigma union there is x x <coughs> so this means i l is a state model of sigma okay and i l is also a state model of there is x x so that means i l x fix to d is a model of x for some d in d right okay this is the meaning of the existential quantifier there is x x is that right we want to show this entails y to show that entails y we have to use this because we already know this entails y right so sigma is okay il is there but x x by c that is to be seen now this c is new to whole of sigma x y c never occurred right now l never interpret c as it is right so what do we do by relevance lemma we take the minimum things only l is uh, exactly appropriate to whatever is there right so because c is not there so we can extend this l it has to be interpreted right so what do we do extend l to l prime so once we say extend it means 
whatever L assigns to variables and constants all the terms they have been kept as it is, we are giving some extra right and calling it L prime. So, L prime by taking L prime of C equal to this D, because we want this to satisfy right, this formula should be satisfied, we have already something like that. So, we take L of C, L prime of C equal to D itself, is that right. Now, what we see? I L satisfies sigma, it is same thing as telling I L prime satisfies sigma, L and L prime agree on everything except C possibly and C does not occur in sigma that is again relevance level right. So, what we see is I L prime satisfies sigma fine. Now, I L x fixed to D satisfies x right, suppose it is like P x. So, I L x fixed to D satisfies P x that means, when you substitute x in terms of D, it says D belongs to phi of P right that relation D belongs to phi of P. Now, look at this L prime satisfies this means what in P x you have substituted x as C, so it is P C right. Now, L prime of C equal to D, so this also says D belongs to phi of P is that ok, because L prime of C is the same thing as L of x fixed to D, they are evaluated the same way fine. So, what we see is I L prime satisfies x, x by C right. Now, since sigma union x, x by C entails y, here is one state model of sigma union x x by c. So, that state model should also be a state model of y that state should be a state model of y due to this is that clear. So, we conclude that I L prime satisfies y ok. Now, I L prime satisfies y L prime and L agree on all the variables constant except possibly C and C does not occur in Y right. So, again due to relevance lemma I L satisfies Y that is what we wanted to show. Is it clear? So, you start with one L valuation L you get the state I L. Then I L satisfies there is x x therefore, you have one element d such that I L x fixed to d satisfies x. Now, if you take define your L prime such that L prime of c equal to d then it is equivalent to telling I L prime satisfies x x by c ok. Then use sigma union x x by c and tells y to conclude I L prime satisfies y. Now, since C does not occur in Y, I L prime or I L satisfy or do not satisfy right, they agree. So, it is equal to telling I L satisfies Y that is what we wanted, is clear. So, now that all the four quantifier laws are proved, you need not even go through all the other laws right, you can prove them by using this quantifier laws that should be easier, but there is a hitch it is this existential specification is not in its full generality, hmm, it is not very general. Why? For example, you say for each x there is y p x y ok. Fine. So, here to capture this existential generation uh, existential specification you need really y to be depending on x right. You choose one x for that x you get some y such that p x y holds. You choose another x it need not be the same y right for the new x. So, y is really dependent on x, but this form of the existential specification says that you will be using the same c for everything right. Though it is not same it is ambiguous it can vary, 
but it does not show up. Okay. This dependence has to be shown somehow, we will do that later, uh, we will wait for some time to come to this generality. Now, for our purpose this is enough, okay. let us see some examples how to tackle the consequences by using this quantifier laws. Okay. Let us take one easy example, say so that this sentence is valid that should be easy. Okay. So, how do you propose to go? See look at the inside of this quantifier for each x. Think of not p implies q implies not q implies p that is a propositional tautology, right? Contraposition and double negation. Okay. So, from a tautology you should get it, but you get what? You get only not p x implies q x implies not q x implies p x that is all, then universally generalize right? to reach out for each x. Fine. So, we start say this way, we say top is equivalent to not p x implies q x implies not q x implies p x. So, justification is tautology or we will write just p l from propositional logic. Okay. Then what do you want to say? From this, we will follow not p x implies q x implies not q x implies p x, and you want to use universal generalization. Now, what will you write here in a calculation? It is not equivalent. Okay. This side entails this, yes, but from this, this does not entail p x does not entail for each x p x, right. But you want to use universal generalization which says if x is a variable that does not occur free in any formula of sigma in the premises, then you can conclude. So, now you see this x on which you are quantifying universally quantifying that does not occur in the premises, there is only one premise here, right. So, you can use universal generalization, but then what to write there? What symbol we will write? Okay, we will devise one symbol, huh? we will write like this. Okay. We will write implies, because this is not entailment. So, what is that we are really writing it here? It is a meta sentence, if from all these things x follows then from all those things for each x x follows that is what we are writing and it is not x entails for each x x. Huh? So, what is the difference between them? You have x entails for each x x another is sigma union x or let us forget sigma take it empty. We say if x is valid then for each x x is valid. So, if you have sigma you will write sigma here, sigma here, sigma here, sigma here also. Okay. Fine. So, now let us look at these two sentences, this is a meta sentence, this is also a meta sentence, but it is of different level, still a higher level. Huh. It involves talking about the entailments itself, this talks about validity, this talks about entailment itself. Right. So, it is still a meta meta sentence, huh. it talks about entailment relation itself. Now, what does it say? This says x entails for each x x means whatever state you take if that is a state model of x then that is a state model of for each x x right or you may say for each i l if i l 
satisfies x then i l satisfies for each x x. What does this say? Now, if then and this for each are interchanged, this says if for each i l i l satisfies x then for each i l i l satisfies for each x x right. So, there is some difference huh? this can be vacuously true if there is one state which falsifies it right. For example, I say uh, if p x is valid then q x is valid that is true right because p x is not valid is it ok. So, it can be very vacuous, but this one is stronger if this holds then this will hold not conversely right. Now, in the calculation we want to write this sentence if sigma entails x then sigma entails for each x x it is not entailment it is weaker than entailment ok entailment is stronger. So, that is why we write some another symbol let us call it implies read it as implies in mathematics this is the symbol we always use right it means exactly this if from all those premises something follows then from all those premises the other thing follows ok it is not really entailment the implies in mathematics ok. Now, what happens is it says it is not only connecting the previous line as per other symbols in the calculation. In a calculation we can use equivalence we can use entailment these two symbols connect to the previous line always right, but this symbol implies does not connect only to the previous line it connects the whole proof before it whole calculation that has gone before it if all those things hold then the next one holds right that is the difference. So, therefore, you can write this with an indentation if it continues if the last line it does not matter it is all right. But if it is not the last line you need another sub calculation here for example, while applying existential specification something else you are assuming here which is not given you require to prove this right and now in this context x x by c becomes an extra premise right. Of course, it has connection with this, but it is an extra it does not appear in the premises fine. Now, this one you assume continue find y then you conclude this. So, that proof or sub calculation itself will slightly push to the right make one indentation to remind that it is a sub calculation we are entering after this we will come to the original right we will see an example how it is used. Say So, this we want to prove ok. Now, you see this x can be out of this right because here it is a sentence that itself where x is not free. So, you could have written this x outside also does not matter which means we can take remove this bracket that is what it is. Okay. Now, suppose you want to prove it by calculation then first you will be using deduction theorem because it is a serial implication something implies B implies C right. So, you say by deduction theorem we show that due to deduction theorem it is enough to show for each x P x implies Q x there is x p x and tells there is x q x 
okay, which is same thing as taking and here also. Fine. So till now it is propositional only reduction theorem. Then we have to give a proof of this. Fine. So how do you go? Where to start with? You may be starting with there is x p x because that c I can use it here to specify for each. Okay. So let us write this way. There is x p x and for each x p x implies q x. I start from there premises. Now you want to use existential specification. I write PC, but I cannot write PC, right? Because from there is X PX, PC does not follow. Okay, but I can use PC. So extra premise I have to take. Then I say that my existential specification starts here with this C. Begins with this new constant C, right? So I say this implies. Let me indent it here. Implies I can have there is x p x r for each x p x implies q x and p c. It is something like in your deduction theorem, in informal proofs, you take on added premise, and then finally you finish, come to that that added premise implies your conclusion, right? So this is an added premise I am taking now. With sigma, I take PC. Now sigma here does not include the rejects PX. So if it is really confusing, you may not start even with the rejects PX. Start with PC itself, right? But that will not give you any hint why you are starting with PC. Fine. So let's keep it as it is. Now then, what do we do? We go for universal specification here. So we write US. This entails there is x, p x, and this we write p c implies q c and p c. So this universal specification we are using by taking x as c. X is substituted by c here. Okay. So this one is equivalent to writing c is new. I am going to introduce c, which is a new constant. Now, from these two, I will use modus ponens to get there is x p x and q c. Okay, is that right? So now, from q c, we'll go for existential generalization. So this gives there is x. P x and there is x Q x from Q C. Fine. Okay. So now what it says, this new formula, what you have got, has no C. There is no C here. Okay. Since there is no C. Our original formulation of existential specification says, if there is no C finally, which is our y now, that y is there is x q x here. Then you can say sigma union there is x x entails y. Right? So this gives you entails. You can say there is x q x. This is and anyway, but this and is immaterial. We never used it anywhere. All it will say is there is x p x, and this one will entail this there is x q x. Is that okay? So what do we do here? Our existential specification ends. Fine. So we repeat it again. We say entails there is x q x, telling that it is existential. Specification with C ends here.
fine. Is it clear how we are going? So, this indentation will tell us that from this step to this step it is only a sub calculation, we could have done it outside instead of bringing in there is x p x also. We can just start with p c and conclude there is x p x, after that you say there is x p x and this entails there is x q x. Is that okay? That is what we are going to do. So, that means, in every step you even could have deleted this there is x p x. Because it is a sub calculation, so you start with P C and then continue find there is x q x. So, all it says this is your sigma, sigma union P C entails there is x q x. Therefore, sigma union there is x P x entails there is x q x. Okay. Can you read the proof now? Where you have to read the theorem of existential specification now it says from this indented sub calculation it says sigma union p c entails there is x q x. Okay. Therefore, sigma union there is x p x entails there is x q x. Okay. Side by side you can also give informal proofs. Now, you are matured, we can do both the things at a time. So, this one we could have started with top, I am just rewriting it huh, to see it as an informal proof. Then by P L it follows not P x implies Q x implies not Q x implies P x. Okay. Now, in informal proofs we will not start with this top, we can say why it is valid, right. So, top enters this that is how we are doing it. So, top is this then this justification will be written here instead. In calculation we write previous step, so that what we are going to do it says. Now, here we are giving justification not we are going to do, but what we have done. So, here we have simply used P L tautology. Then third one we simply write for each x not p x implies q x implies not q x implies p x by universal generalization. This is what we wanted to prove, right. So, our proof says that we start with p c Right. So, you say here justification as existential specification with C begins, which can be one extra assumption. Okay. Before this, if you want to list all your premises, you can keep it. Informal proof allows that. Right. So, it is wiser to start with all the premises listed. Fine. So, instead of this, we will start with 1 for each x p x implies q x 2 we will write there is x p x all these are premises or let us write hypothesis rather than premises huh? to not confuse with our p yes. Informal proof has some formality, huh? so it does not use the symbols entailment or equivalence symbols. Yeah, but that right. is also not completely formal. Calculation is also not formal, right? but calculation can be made formal. Similarly, informal proofs, they are just different styles. Right? Problem is in calculation, you have to connect with the previous lines in P L. Informal proof has some more informality. Huh? You can just use any premise anywhere, does not matter. Okay, that is the difference. Here in calculation you can show what is equivalent to what, what entails from where and so on. 
in informal proof it is not equivalence, it is only entailment, there is another difference. Okay. So, let us see how does it proceed. So, this will be our third line now, here it starts, because there is x p x is there we start with p c, it does not follow from it. So, you have to write it specifically that it does not follow, but it is one extra premise we are adding due to existential specification. Then we instantiate from 1, it says P c implies Q c 1 universal specification. If you want to mention how you specified, you may write x by c, x has been substituted by c, just to say what is the specification. Then we use modus ponens as earlier, so 3, 4 modus ponens and then 6 there is x q x from 5 existential generalization. Okay. Now, you get a formula y which is independent of this ambiguous name or new constant c fine. Therefore, we say once more we have to write there is x q x it follows from the premises where your existential specification ends. Is that okay? That is how it will be proceeding in informal proofs. Let us take one more example. Let us see whether this has a proof or not. Okay. So, can we try one informal proof first? Okay, Let us see. So, what is our plan? We want for each y q y. So, we should be able to get q y from somewhere. Now, how to get q y from this anyway? This will come from there is x p x, so I can have p c, then I instantiate c with this, I get for each y p c implies q y, then p c is not having y, so I can use my distributive law and right? take that out, so I get for each y q y directly, huh? I do not need universal generalization here also. If you do not want, you can instantiate that y, if you do not want to use distribution, instantiate that y, get p c apply m p get q y for h y q y is that ok. So, let us write it. So, I start with uh, this one premises it is a premise second there is x p x is a premise Next, I want to use existential specification. Okay. So, I say P c fourth for each y P c implies Q y from one universal specification. Then, I say P c implies for each y q y distribution for distribution. Next P c and this gives for each y q y 3 5 mode exponents. Okay. Next Since you have got it, you do not stop it here. If you stop, it will say for each x for each y p x implies q y and p c gives for each y q y, because this is an extra premise you have used, it has to go. Right? 
So, next is for each y q y. So, we will write uh, E s C E. Now, in order that this is concluded, you should have a premise there is x p x. Right? If it is not a premise, then it cannot be concluded. Do you see that? So, along with this, better write what premise you have used. Right? So, similarly, here E s C E, you are using that as a premise, there is x p x. Right? But in a calculation anyway, we have to see it, we do not refer it back. In informal proof, you can read it where it is really used. So, for example, here when you write there is x q x, better use 2, you are using that as a premise, that is why it is followed, otherwise, it does not follow. Huh? Is it clear? Here, for example, you have for each y q y, this follows with p c as a premise. Right. Now, when we use essential specification with P C and this to conclude the is x p x with this give you for each y q y. So, that means the is x p x is used as a premise now. Yes. P x used for 3 itself. No. When you say P C. It is not used because the is x p x never enters P C. That is the whole point in the essential specification itself. Otherwise, we would not need essential specification in that form. Right? So, since it is there, we are taking this as the extra premise, but that is extra information, it does not entail. Okay? All it says is 1 along with 3 gives you 6, therefore, 1 along with 2 gives you 7, that is essential specification. Is that clear? So, we mention 2 E s C. first symbolize this and then try to give a proof, whether you can give a proof or not. So, all that we have done today is use the laws, these four laws and earlier ones. So, there is one thing you can try in the proof itself for the last one, instead of using distribution here, try to use the laws, this quantifier laws and still conclude it. Right? which will give you some confidence that I do not need to remember so many laws. These four quantifier laws along with the P L laws will be enough.